Good morning. Welcome to our Facebook live service today. We're starting just a couple of minutes earlier. I'm, <laughs> I guess I'll make up for last week. I was a few minutes late. Uh, but anyway, we're, we're talking about the Word of God that can give you the victory. You know, Paul prayed for the church as he was preparing to depart this world, and he uh, commended them to, to the Word of God's grace that was able to build them up and give them their inheritance. And, you know, that's our heart here in ministry is to... Uh, help cultivate your relationship give you the tools that will help you and enable you to cultivate your own relationship with the Lord so that you don't have to depend on some man to tell you what's right or what's wrong or what works or what doesn't work you you have your own relationship with the Lord listen I, I don't know anybody other than Jesus that's perfect and and uh, I'm so thankful for the relationship that we have with him I'm so thankful for the times in my life where I was doing everything I knew to do, and it still wasn't going right, but Jesus brought correction or instruction, and, and it ended up producing the results that I really wanted, and that's really what my heart is. My heart isn't to shame anybody for not knowing the things they don't know, but I just want to share with you the things that I have learned over the years from God's Word and from my relationship with Him through His Word, and, and uh, I want to help you. I just want to bless you. Amen. Uh, there are times in doing that that I know we approach subjects that are a little bit touchy and uh, kind of right now in the middle of it, you know, we're a little bit in the middle of that type of a subject because we're going to talk about prayer and everybody kind of thinks they know what prayer is and what prayer is about, but, you know, do we really? Have we really studied the Word of God out? Do we really? And, and do we really get the results that we we want to see in prayer and what, what it seems the Word would offer us in prayer? Well, I want to give you some insights that I believe will help give you greater success in your prayer life and in your overall walk with God. You remember when Jesus was talking to Simon Peter and the other disciples and in our primary text for this overall series of messages, he he uh, asked first, he said, who do men say that I am? And they all answered. And then he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter really stepped up. He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and uh, Jesus responded quite, quite favorably to that, didn't he? Yeah. Amen. He, and he ultimately told Simon Peter something. He said, upon this rock. You know, he told me flesh and blood hadn't revealed that unto you, but my Father which is in heaven, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it and so uh, Jesus when he describes the church describes a undefeatable body of believers that are committed to their relationship with the father and in touch with their father and I believe that's the secret to our empowerment is our ability to fellowship with the father relate with the father I remember years ago hearing a, a preacher that I greatly respect brother Kenneth Hagin and he, he made the observation, he said, prayer is fellowshipping with our Father. First and foremost and above all else, it's fellowshipping with our Father. And, and it's joining forces with our Father God. Now that's a little bit radical, but we're going to see in the Word of God today, it's, it's not at all unscriptural. But he said, it's fellowshipping the Father, it's joining forces with God the Father, it's executing His will upon this earth, or performing His will upon this earth. Amen. And uh, I'm so thankful again for the relationship that we have with the Lord. Now, we've been talking a little bit about our subject in relation to this present hour. You know, there's, there's a lot going on with this present pandemic. Some people don't believe there's a pandemic at all, that it's just a bunch of fear tactics. And, you know, I think, I think there's a little something to it, but not near as much as what's been made out of it. But it sure has got people shaken. And uh, either people are shaking because they are fearful of the disease itself, or they're shaking because they see the government seizing such incredible control over the personal lives and uh, overrunning the individual rights of believers, contrary to our nation's constitution. And so any way you look at it, there's cause for concern. And I'm not going to debate, you know, who's right or who's wrong on this. I've got my own thoughts, but I'll keep them to myself and I'm going to pray. But I do know this, that as time progresses, uh, the, this world and the governments of this world will, by design, seize greater and greater control over individuals to the point that, as we've shared before, 
even over in Revelation that talks about how there's coming a day that, that those that are upon this earth at that time won't be able to buy, sell, or trade unless they worship the image of the beast and receive his mark on their forehead or hand. And uh, <laughs> again, that's one of those subjects, there's all kinds of speculation about it, and, and we could spend probably a lifetime speculating ourselves. We're not going to do that, amen? I'm just going to say this, the best way to avoid being caught in that kind of a situation is to learn how to live independent from our government. Rather than expecting our government to do more and more for us, which, you know, they're not giving anything away. They're taking your money. When, when they are giving benefits to folks, they're doing it by seizing tax money from individuals. And, and uh, you know, that's a whole other subject within itself. But nothing is free. If it's too good to be true, it, 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 it's not true. And so anyway, um, you know, the government can only print so much money before they're going to go belly up anyway. So uh, it would really serve us to learn how to live by faith, walk by faith and not by sight. It's kind of interesting because I've been studying after this, this uh, uh, <clears throat> well, after this line of thought, ever in, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 8, it says, What saith it? His word is nigh thee. It's in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. It calls the Bible, the good news, the gospel of Christ Jesus, the word of faith. And I've been studying this uh, since my return to the Lord out, out of backsliddenness years ago. Most folks know that back in the late 1970s, I had uh, overdosed and died. I, I, I was dead. They estimated upwards of 10, as much as 15 minutes without pulse, without respiration. And uh, by a miracle of God's grace, I was revived and I was sustained. And three days later, I came to myself in the hospital. Well, the Lord had mercy on me. I actually visited heaven during that brief time and and uh, saw my grandmother that had passed years before, visited with her. And uh, and now here I was back. And, and you'd think that would be enough to wake me up, but it really didn't. It was still a year or two later that I really started to get serious with the Lord. And I told the Lord, I said, look, I got no problem with you. It's your people that give me a problem. And I think that's true of a lot of folks. And by his people, you know, a lot of times we attribute to God things that are not God. Uh, religious folks aren't of God. They're, the religious folks in Jesus' day claimed to know God. And Jesus said, if you really knew him, you'd know me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and uh, they didn't know him, so they didn't know the Father. And so I, I was... I was just throwing out the baby with the bathwater by rejecting the church and, and people altogether. And, and uh, I can remember one time I told the Lord when I was just, I was fighting him a little bit about going to church. And I said, I just don't like those hypocrites. He said, well, then don't be one. He said, you get in there and show them how it's lived right. If you know so much. And, and uh, you know, I found out some of those hypocrites were doing the best they could. I don't like hypocrisy. I don't know anybody that does, but sometimes people just haven't been given anything more to work with, and it's up to us to live a testimony that will demonstrate to them there's more to be had. Amen? So anyway, I started studying along these lines. The Lord specifically led me and directed me uh, to attend Rama Bible Training Center. I, I'm, I'm so thankful for that. I don't know how many people I've known over the years that we've been able to minister to, including family members, that lived a longer life, a healthier life, a more blessed life because of the things we learned and were able to share with them. We've, we've got family members that would have been dead before their time had it not been for the, the truth of God's word that we learned and how to stand and receive uh, things from God such as healing or deliverance and miracles, uh, even for provision. So anyway, to me, ever since I came back, this message has been relevant. Yes. Uh, I've not had to beg or believe God for every little crumb or morsel I've ever eaten, but you know what? I've thanked Him for every one that I've eaten because I believe ultimately He supplies all good things. Amen? And, and uh, so anyway, a lot of folks have kind of, you know, they, they've seen this as a bit of an extreme teaching, many deeming it irrelevant, but you know what? If it will help wean you, from dependence upon a government that would like to control you to your own demise, it, it's pretty relevant. Uh, and, and I keep referring back, because the Lord brought it to me, referring back to Noah and his ark. You know, Noah built that ark. They estimate it took him from 100 to 120 years 
to build that ark. And don't you know, every day he woke up that it didn't rain, it seemed kind of irrelevant. But God telling you to do something is all you need to make it relevant. And if he tells you to walk by faith and not by sight, believe you me, it's relevant, and you're going to need to depend on it one day. And, and so that's why we're continuing to teach along these lines of the word of faith and, and, and the believer's authority. It's just absolutely essential that we do so. Now, there's some people that have shunned it because they don't like responsibility. And you know what? When you start learning the word of faith, you, you start realizing God's not the problem. He's not holding out. Never has been the problem. Right. If there's an issue with our spiritual effectiveness in life, then it's not God. It's us. Yeah. And, and, and you know what? There's some good news in that. Yeah, we have to accept re responsibility a bit. But by our accepting that responsibility, we also are empowered to produce or bring about change by, uh, in, in, by applying God's wisdom, learning His ways and applying His wisdom yes. and becoming more effective. Amen? Amen? So whether it seems like it or not, this is one of the most relevant messages you could ever learn about the Word of Faith. Now, we, we, we got to a point several weeks ago where we were starting to talk a little bit about prayer because going back again to the church, uh, Jesus said, this is a foundation that's built on your ability and the Father's ability to commune one with another, to fellowship one with another, our ability to pray. Um, but the truth is, is when we start examining prayer and our relationship with the Father in the light of Scripture, uh, it'll almost take your breath away. Yeah. You know, what is that saying that life does not consist in, in, in the breaths you take, but in the moments you live that take that breath away. Yeah. And there's some of those that will happen when you really begin to get intimate with your Father through the study of His Word and time spent in fellowship through prayer. Yeah. Amen. Uh, so let's, let's read very quickly. In Psalms 8, it's kind of interesting. It shows us the, the tendency that men have to choke at the, the reality of God's word, the blunt reality of his word. In Psalms 8, verse 1, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the... <clears throat> I'm sorry. I've got a little note there that's covering my notes. A note covering notes. Anyway, it says, When I consider the he thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now the translators use the word angels here. But we've already discussed this before, and so I'm going to just make a brief reference to it. The word that's translated angels comes from the Hebrew word Elohim, and it's plural for the Lord God. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. In fact, it's used in the first word, uh, first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God. It was Elohim. Yes. It was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, talking amongst themselves. <laughs> Amen. So anyway, uh, it says, Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. Well, we know that back in Genesis, God said, Let's make man in our image and after our likeness. What was God saying? He said, I want to make this this creation this man i want to make him as much like me i want him to look as much like me as he can and i want him to be as much like me as he can that was the father's intention and, and uh, you know he put adam in this world to be ultimately the god of this creation as his son and as his representative as well as his creation not his son but as his creation and and uh his representative in the earth and so he gave adam dominion didn't he amen Glory to God over everything that crept upon the earth. Well, let's go back and look very quickly. He said in Genesis 1:26, God said, <clears throat> Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, he was planning on more than Adam, even when he first created him, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Amen. Look at that. There's, there's nothing that was upon this earth that was not subject to the authority God had delegated to his creation, to his man. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. 
subdue it. They were to extra. God didn't just give them that dominion to to give them some kind of a little token uh, gift of some kind. He gave them this gift to be used. They're gifts that God has given the body of Christ today to be used to their advantage and His glory, and, and we must use them if that's to be accomplished. Amen. So he said, Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So there was nothing on this earth that was not subject to the authority given Adam. Amen? Listen to this. And he reiterates it again. It says down here in verse 29, God said, Behold, I've given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, every tree, in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat, and to, and to every beast of the earth, and every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made. Behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Well, things are going pretty good so far, but then came temptation. Look over, if you would, Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Verse 1 says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Notice here it tells us than any beast of the field. <laughs> was a serpent something that crept upon the earth? Yeah. Well, well, wouldn't that mean that Adam had dominion here? Absolutely. God made Adam, and he positioned him in this earth to keep it and to subdue it along with his helpmate Eve. Glory to God. So it says, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of the, every tree of the garden. I, I don't know about you, but I used to hear the story of creation recalled and then the temptation. And, and I always somehow pictured that Adam was off working in the fields and tending to the crops or whatever, doing anything but there. But, but I want you to notice something here. Verse 1, it introduces the serpent the adversary in the form of the serpent. Amen? But look on down, if you would, not very much further to verse 6. It says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her. With her. Adam wasn't off doing something else. He was right there. Yeah. Whose fault was it that Adam fell, that Adam sinned? You know, what What should he have done when, when that serpent first appeared? He, he should have subdued it. He should have taken authority over it. He should have exercised dominion by speaking with authority, shouldn't he? He could have subdued that. He could have stopped it. it. It wasn't a matter of Adam even having to pray and ask God to do something about that serpent. Adam was commissioned and equipped to do it. Right. And the fact that he didn't was not only a matter of neglect, but it was a matter of great regret for all of humanity. Do you realize had Adam simply done what God commissioned him to do, God equipped him to do, there would never have been the first grave ever dug. That's right. Nobody ever would have died, amen? Because death wouldn't have entered in through sin. Well, uh, you know, every time you go by a hospital, thank God for doctors and hospitals, but, but wouldn't it have been nice had we never needed them? Yeah. Every time you go by a graveyard, wouldn't it be nice had there never needed be yeah. a grave ever dug? Right. Or, or what about when we see these commercials that, thank God for those that are doing acts of benevolence and, and uh, help uh, for children in the world. Robin and I were watching some presentation on TV the other day, and they were showing these children that were born with cleft palates and, and uh, hair lips and and oh, it just tore at your heart to see those precious little babies and to imagine the kind of suffering that their parents went through and that they went through. You know, it was a miracle that many of them survived to get big enough to where they could actually operate on some of them at the ages they showed them. Yeah. But, but think about that. That never would have been had Adam not sinned, the suffering that's inflicted on humanity. People often say, well, why does God let such evil prevail? He doesn't. Man does. It was by Adam's invitation, yes. by he, his having refused to exercise dominion and subdue the enemy. It was through that that, 
that all these things came upon humanity and all the suffering was inflicted upon them. You know, the disciples were, were with Jesus one day and he saw a man that was blind from birth. And they asked him, they said, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither. Well, no, there's some things that are just what they are in this world because of what Adam did. Yeah. It, it opened the door and the devil took advantage and he's inflicted suffering upon humanity. But thank God, Christ came to redeem us uh, from yeah. sin, death, and from the curse of the law. Amen. And that's what we're trying to teach you from the Word of God, is how to walk in your redemption. Notice this temptation situation. Adam was there. Adam could have done something. Adam didn't do anything. And, and so uh, that, that basically introduced the suffering that has been inflicted upon humanity. Amen. It wasn't a matter of Adam didn't pray and ask God to do something. It was a matter that Adam didn't do what he could have done with what God had given him. What if there were things in our lives that God has equipped us to do and called us to do that somehow we mistakenly all these years have thought it was up to God to do? Mm. Might that explain why some of the things that have concerned us seem like they really just hadn't concerned God? You know, I'm sure, I'm sure that, that you know, if we look on without knowing what we know of our Father and knowing what His Word tells us, if we've been there and in the garden, we'd, we might have wondered, well, why didn't God intervene? Because he'd given Adams the tools that God himself would have used to intervene with. It was up to Adam, and Adam had dominion. The devil later in the temptation of the wilderness told Jesus, he's, he showed him the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said, I'll give you these kingdoms and the authority of them if you'll just bow your knee to me. And, and uh, he said, for they've been given unto me. Well, they were given unto him. It wouldn't have been a temptation if he didn't have it to offer. But who gave them unto the devil? Who gave them unto Satan, the tempter? Uh, Adam did when he sinned. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Now look at this. Why doesn't God intervene? Because he's, he has intervened. He intervened back then by equipping and commissioning Adam to act in his behalf to subdue this world. But listen to this in James chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, He giveth more grace, speaking of the Lord toward believers, he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Who are the proud? The people that know everything and can't be taught. <laughs> right? Well, I don't need to be taught. I know everything. No, you don't. <laughs> We're going to be learning till, till Jesus comes to gather us up and catch us away. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. There's going to be some things we're going to learn on that journey to heaven, too. Well, listen to this. He, he said, He giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Notice it doesn't say pray and ask God to do anything about the devil here. It tells you to resist the devil. Over in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it tells us, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil. Whose adversary is he? He's mine. This is personal. He's your adversary. Amen? Because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Notice he can't devour just anybody. Who does he devour? People that either aren't saved, they're already devoured, or people that are ignorant of who they are and what they have as sons and daughters of God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. That's who he devours. But it tells us this. He said, your, your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he, may, whom he may devour. Whom resists steadfast in the faith? Whom resists? Notice it tells you to resist the devil. Again, there's no indication that we're to pray and ask God to do anything about the devil. But we're to resist the devil, remaining steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Yeah. So we've been given authority as believers to ourselves do something about the devil. Just like Adam had been given authority back in, in Eden to resist the devil and to subdue everything upon this earth and bring it into subjection to his authority as God's agent in this world and creation, we've been commissioned of God and we have been empowered of God to bring the devil to, to subjection. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Listen to this. I love this. 
this is an account of, of and it, you'll see the relevance of this in a moment too. Sometimes we, we share things and we go a couple of different directions. Listen, this is one of these teachings that we could go from Genesis to Revelation and back about 10 times and still not cover everything in it. But listen to this. Uh, the Bible talks about the power of attorney and it talks about authority and the authority of believers. Uh, but it demonstrates how much credence God himself gives the power of attorney. In Matthew chapter 8, in, in verse 7, uh, there's the account, or it's kind of in the middle of the account, of the centurion servant. Remember the centurion had a, uh, he was a Roman centurion, he wasn't even a Jew, he was a Gentile, yeah. but he had a, a Jewish servant that was sick, that was dear to him. And, and so he reached out to Jesus. It says, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion. I want you to underline that. It says, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. It's very important that you, you underline that and you remember that phrase. There came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. In verse 7 it says, And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. So in this account we see that it specifically says that this man himself approached Jesus in behalf of his servant. But look on over, if you would, very quickly to Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, and we'll pick up in verse 1. Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, and verse 1, it's speaking again of Jesus, says, Now when he had entered all, ended all his sayings in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum. And a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. Same centurion, same servant. <clears throat> Listen to verse 3. <clears throat> and when he heard of Jesus, he said unto him, the elders of the Jews. Wait a minute. Back in Matthew 8, 5, it says there came unto him a centurion. But in verse 3, this same incident, in verse 3 from Luke's account, it says that that centurion didn't go personally, but that he said unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they, they who? Those elders of the Jews. Again, the emphasis is upon the fact that it was the elders of the Jews that went, not the centurion himself. So who's right here? One account, I mean, these are both Bible accounts. These are both inspired accounts. So who's right? Both are. Both are. Yeah. You see, when you sent someone in your behalf to do your bidding, it was counted as though it was you yourself doing that same bidding. So when the centurion sent elders of the Jews to represent him before Jesus, it was considered as though the centurion himself had approached Jesus. Yes. <laughs> I love this account here. It says in verse 4, When they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. And Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him. He, he still didn't approach Jesus. Why? He didn't need to, though. He had emissaries that he had sent from his own right hand. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. To do his bidding. And so even by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, with these two seemingly varied accounts, we can see that God was, in fact, honoring the, the power of attorney here. This, this thing that we call power of attorney. The fact that this centurion had authorized these men to act as his agents accounted, you know, was accounted by God as though the centurion himself were doing these things. So it says, Then Jesus went with them when he was now not far from the house, and the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my... And we know the end of this. Jesus commends his faith. He said, Many shall come from the east and the west. Uh, you know, uh, uh, he just, well, it says in verse 9, Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I send you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. Wow. And they that were sent, returning to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Glory to God. Well, listen to this. In First John chapter 5, it talks about us as believers. In verse 13, uh, it, it's telling us, these things have I written unto you that believe. So that'd be you and me, wouldn't it? Is Jesus your Lord? Are, are you born again? If you're not, it's as simple as confessing Jesus. Say, Jesus, 
I confess you to be my Lord. I believe the Father raised you up. Yeah. I don't understand it with my head altogether, right. but I accept you and receive you in my heart as my Lord and Savior. It's just that easy to get saved. Amen. And so he says down here, once you do that, once you've made that, that confession of faith in the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, these things are written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. That seems kind of redundant, doesn't it? What did he mean in that you may believe on the name of the Son of God? We've been given this name. Amen. Yes. Glory to God. In other words, God has sent us forth in the name of Jesus to cast out demons, to lay hands on the sick. Glory to God. Yes. Read Mark chapter 16 sometime. And, and uh, understand this, that it's talking about you acting in God's behalf in this world. To, the reality is, is, is in the biblical languages, such as the Hebrew, and, and then again in, in the Greek, this would be in the Greek, in the biblical languages, very often there will be a number of different Greek words that are translated with one English word. We saw that over in Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Jesus said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread upon the serpent and the scorpion over all the power of the enemy. We saw the word power there twice in that verse, and yet it comes from two different and totally separate Greek words. The first word power is authority. Jesus was talking to believers. He said, I give you authority over the power or the ability of the devil. Amen? Do you, under, do you see where we're going with that? In other words, we see one word in the English, power, but in reality, if you were to read uh, the, the Greek, you would see that there were two different words, one meaning authority and the other one meaning ability. Well, the same thing is true of this word ask. There are a number of different words in the Hebrew that have been translated ask. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail just yet, but I want you to remember this word ask. Jesus said this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hear this. Now, how many of you have ever asked something that you really thought was according to the will of God, but nothing happened? Yeah. I mean, have you ever... James said, you have not because you ask not. Well, I've done a whole lot more asking than getting at times in my life. Yeah. How about you? Sure. What is this saying here? Uh, <laughs> glory to God. He said, if we ask him, let me, let me give you something to consider. This word that's translated ask is from the Strong's Dictionary given a number, assigned a number to identify it, the number 154. Mm -hmm. And and that word in the Greek is ayateho. Ayateho. And, and when you look it up in the Strong's Dictionary, at first it, it looks like it's to make a request. But we're going to talk about that later. I just want you to remember this. It says, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Again, this word ask in verse 15 is aiteho. And it sounds like it's telling us that when we request something from God, if we know it's his will, now that tells me something. Number one, we need to know his will before we approach him, don't we? Right. Amen. But if we ask something according to his will, then we can have confidence that not only has he heard us, but that he's granted us that petition. Amen? Glory to God. Yes. Now, the truth is, is that word ask, Iteho, means to make a demand for something which is due. Wow. So he's not saying asking God to do something. It, 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 Back in the garden, remember the temptation? It wasn't a matter of Adam needing to pause and, and petition and ask God to do something about the devil. It was a matter of Adam himself stepping up and using the tools God had given him according to the directions or the instructions the Lord had given him and do something himself about that serpent. Yes. And there's a lot of things today that you and I have been commissioned of God to deal with, equipped of God to deal with, that if they're going to get dealt with, it's up to us, not him. It's up to us to resist the devil that he would flee from us. It's up to us to resist the devil steadfast in the faith. It's not up to God. It's up to you. 
How do you do that? You learn what's yours by right of the blood of Jesus and you demand your rights. Yes. You are partnered with God to enforce his will even to your own benefit in your own behalf. Yes. But see, the things you do don't just affect you. They affect those you care about. When Noah built that boat, it wasn't just so Noah would survive. He had loved ones that were depending upon his obedience to God. There are loved ones that, that are depending on your obedience to God. If somebody doesn't step up and say, Look, I may have been wrong about this, but I'm willing to hear from heaven. God, show me in your word. There are people that are waiting and depending upon you and your willingness to humble yourself. Remember, God resists the proud. If we, we can do it our way. We can insist on doing it our way. But if instead of doing that, and God resisting us, we'll humble ourselves, and say, Lord, teach me your ways. We can get results. Amen. Yes, yes. Glory to God. See, the disciples, they had grown up in a culture of prayer. We already talked about that. But they had grown up in a culture of prayer. And 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 the, yet they, they came to Jesus one day and said, teach us how to pray. They realized that their prayers weren't nearly as effective as those that Jesus was praying. Or even those of the disciples of John the Baptist. There was something more to learn. And thank God they had enough humility to say, listen, uh, I, I, I don't know it all, but I know somebody that does. His name is Jesus. Lord, teach me. I, I believe that's one of the most powerful prayers you can pray is, Lord, teach me to pray. Yes. Teach yes. me from your word. I've always thought it was this way, but I'm learning, Lord. Maybe, maybe I was mistaken. Yes. Show me what's right. Yes. He leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yes. Glory to God. We just need to follow his lead, don't we? Well, let me give you this very quickly. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 40, Jesus was talking, and he was talking about believers. And he said, He that receiveth you receiveth me. Remember when the, the centurion sent servants to approach Jesus in his behalf and in behalf of his servant yes. that had need? It was accounted as though that centurion himself had gone. Jesus himself is saying, He that receiveth you receiveth me he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me so we in this earth are here as agents in god's behalf we're we're laborers with god co-laborers with christ jesus we're here in this world to do the father's bidding amen yes. what does that look like well jesus said over in john's gospel chapter 14 and verse 12 he said he that believeth on me the works that i do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto the Father. and He went unto the Father so that the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon all flesh uh, 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 and, and that we might receive that endowment of power from on high. Why? Because God wants us as his children, as his sons and daughters, as his representatives in this world to enforce his will by the authority entrusted to us and, and the power given us by the name of Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. So, Jesus taught the disciples to pray. And it's interesting here. He, he started out telling them not, you know, what not to do. But in, in uh, Hebrews, I'm sorry, in, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 2, he said, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Yes, yes. Thy, he didn't say, God, send your kingdom, send your kingdom. No, we're here to release the kingdom of God yes. and, and affect his rule upon this earth. Yes by the authority that he's given us and the command of faith. Amen. Listen, uh, uh, this word, I, I just really want to encourage you. If you have access to some study works, get you, get you a Strong's Concordance. If you don't have one, you ought to have one. Get a Strong's Concordance. And, and if you can find an Englishman's Concordance, a lot of times you can find these tools online and just use them on the Internet. Yeah. But uh, an Englishman's Concordance, look up that that. Strong's Word 154, and look at the references within that. It, it will break that word down to you. It's a compound word, but it'll break it down for you, and it'll show you its origin and its usage and give you a little bit of insight. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. We're going to get into I'll give it to you uh, later on in this. Maybe next week we'll be able to get into it. Uh, but it, it's really important that we understand what God was saying. When, when James said, you have not because you ask not we read that you request not but again it was that same word yeah. and well, what it's saying is God God was telling us 
I believe by the inspiration of James, by the Holy Spirit, he was saying, you're not demanding what's yours by right of the blood. That's why you don't have what you want. Yeah. And, and the same's true today. It's not a matter. Uh, God in his word says, I've given unto you all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called you to his glory and virtue. Uh, God's already given us everything we need, but we receive it by exercising our faith and demanding what is due. We're not demanding it of God. No, no. Though over in Isaiah 45, uh, the Lord tells us, command ye me according to my word. Yeah. <laughs> God's saying, let me loose. Let me loose. Use your authority in this world to command my will be done. Learn, my, uh, learn what my will is. <laughs> Amen. And, and command that it be done so that, that I can do the things that I want to do and that your heart longs to see done. How many of you have seen people that were suffering that if there was anything you could do, you would have done something? There might be something you could do if you'd learn God's ways. Yes. Amen. There really might be. I, I tell you, there's, it's such a blessing. I've, I've gone into hospital rooms when people have given, been given just days to live. And because of these things I'd learned from God through his word, I was able to stand there and tell him, you can live and not die, and this is how you do it. And, and I can remember, you know, time and again, different ones that were given up to die. One, one individual, Bill Clem, had, had been diagnosed with a, a very vicious form of, of cancer. Uh, it, 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 it just, it, I think there were, at the time, three other men that had been diagnosed with it and within just weeks or months all three of them were dead yeah. but bill lived yes, what was yes. the difference god's word yes. and, and and praying amen knowing how to pray and to speak to those things he he lived a number it was over a decade more i think it's 15 20 years more yeah. that he lived following that diagnosis and he was the only one at that time i i've, I've had the opportunity to go into people's hospital rooms when the doctors had given up on them and and to minister to folks in our church where where there was no medical hope for them now thank god for doctors thank god for medicine i'm not telling you to quit going to the doctor in fact i remember one young lady i ministered to that had been given just days to live and i told her i said you do whatever the doctors tell you uh, but you meanwhile thank god that healing is yours because we received it when we prayed i told her i spoke to her about faith told her how to receive and she did. Do you know that two weeks later, she was supposed to be at her own funeral? Yeah, yeah. And yet three weeks later, she showed up in church. And the interesting thing is, is she didn't just get healed on my faith and, and my prayers, but she really took to heart the Word of God. And about a year later, she relapsed. She had a, another diagnosis. Was just get, A doctor got so hateful with her, yeah. told her just go home and die. Yeah. But thank God, and she turned to him, she said, No, I'll live and I'll not die, and declare the glory of my Lord to my generation. And she's, to this day, best I know, she's still alive. And that was 30-something years ago. Almost, almost 40 years ago. But she's still alive. We've got something that people need. We've got something that we need. Yes. Will yes. we just simply be humble enough to accept that maybe yes. we don't know it all, but if we're, if we're willing to learn, God can teach us. Amen. I believe it's so important. Will you let God teach you to pray? Well, my my grandma taught. Well, grandma taught you. She she worked with what she had. But you know what? Thank God, there have been advances in the. We're told in the last days the knowledge of the Word of God is going to cover the the face of the earth like the waters cover the oceans. Amen. Uh, th that means that, that there's coming forth more and more, more knowledge as time progresses. Uh, it's time to drink in some of that knowledge. Amen. Glory to God. Oh, I tell you, there's there's so much here that I want to share with you, and we just don't have time to get into it today. Amen. <clears throat> I, I, I love this. John 15, verse 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Guess what that word ask is? It's, again, the Greek word, 154. That's the number designation in Strong's. 154, Aitea. So what Jesus is saying is if you abide in fellowship with me and you allow my words to abide in you, in other words, you meditate God's word, you speak it over yourself and over your situations, 
ye shall demand what you will, and it shall be given unto you. Amen. <clears throat> a whole lot different than asking Jesus to do something or making a request of him. In fact, uh, look with me very quickly. We're going to close with it. I said we'd close with that, but look over, if you would, very quickly to John 16. John 16. I'll close with this, but we're going to pick up with it again. I know it takes a while for some of these things to kind of get settled in you. And listen, if you're struggling right now, just just don't struggle with it. Just trust the Lord to help you to see what you need to see it in His timing. Listen, there have been times that, that I've had books highly recommended to me by people I greatly respected, and I picked up those books. I'm talking about Bible books, study books. I picked up those books, and I read them, and I was more confused when I put them down than when I picked them up. But I, I prayed. I said, Lord, there's got to be... I, I value these men that recommended this to me and their insights and their understanding, and I know there's more than what I'm seeing. And I can remember one book was Bodily Healing and the Atonement by T.J. McCrossan. And, and uh, listen, it's not light reading. It's not casual reading, but it's powerful. And I picked that book up. I kid you not. I picked it up one morning. I read it, and I... I'm sitting there, I, I, honest to God, I'm just shaking my, my I don't, I'm not seeing it, Lord. I'm not seeing it, Lord. Help me to see it, Jesus. <laughs> Help me to see it. And do you know the funny thing was, was I don't know how many hours it was later, but that was early in the early, well, late morning, early afternoon. I'd read, uh, Later on that evening after dinner, I was sitting there and the Spirit of God started calling to remember some of the things from that book. And it was like fireworks going off in my head. I mean, it started, things started coming to light and making sense, and it just literally, it was one of those take your breath away moments. Actually, it was a series of them. It's like, man, how do I catch my breath again after the insights the Lord gave me? Amen. Glory to God. And it wasn't just deep, lofty stuff. It was good, practical, relevant teaching. Yes. Amen. I'm, I'm not in it for deep, deep revelation. Some people get so deep, all they do is drown. Yeah. Uh, I, I, to me, it, it, deep is something I can put my teeth in and, and right. walk in. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Listen to this very quickly. John 16, verse 23, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he's talking about a day when the Holy Spirit would come to empower believers. And he says, In that day ye shall ask me nothing. Now this word ask is different. It actually is the the... Greek word that would translate more accurately into in that day you shall make no request of me yeah, yeah. <laughs> can you imagine a day coming that you never ask Jesus for anything that's really what he's saying folks why wouldn't you ask him for anything because he's already given you everything <laughs> you're an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ Jesus yeah. glory to God and so it says, In that day you shall make no request of me. You shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall ask, guess what word that is? Iateo, 154. Whatsoever ye shall demand the Father in my name, he will give it to you. In other words, when you rise up, use the authority God's given you, and speak with the command of faith, the will of God, God's going to enforce it to your advantage, to his glory. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Glory to God. I love this. Verse 24 says, Hitherto you have demanded nothing in my name. I'm just going to use that word demanded because that's really what the word asked is. Yeah. You have demanded nothing in my name. Demand and you shall receive. See, there's a lot of people that are just kind of hesitantly, reluctantly asking and petitioning and begging and pleading and there ain't no faith in it. Learn what's yours and command it to manifest. Amen. Amen. Start talking to your body. Oh, I just believe God's going to do something. Yeah, he did. He equipped you to speak his word with authority and release his power yes. to your advantage and to his glory. Yeah. question is, will you do it? We're going to talk about this more next week. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, I tell you, I believe there are great things ahead. Listen, you know, the... the <clears throat> One reason I believe the church will be raptured is because of the the effect it has in limiting the devil's ability to exercise dominion. In other words, the Holy the Holy Ghost, you know, well, let's put it this way. Jesus will return because 
the church is such an impediment to what must occur in the latter days of this world that, that it's going to have to be removed mm -hmm. until that which leadeth is taken out of the way. Yeah. That, that's us. Yeah. That's us. You've got so much more authority and ability to impact this world than the devil would ever have you to know. Stick with us and you'll learn anyway. Amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for being with us today. We'll see you next week.